everyone, and welcome to the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. We're happy to have you here with us for the public seminar on the, on the tax reform for accreditation and inclusion program for government, also known as the TRAIN. Today, we have invited experts who will share their insights about the topic on hand. But before we give you the floor, or before we give the floor to our speakers, may I call on its President, Dr. Celia Reyes, for her opening remarks. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're pleased to have you all here. Uh, we know this is a very important topic, and I'm sure we've had first-hand experience when we filed our income tax uh, this year. Uh, we would have felt uh, some of the provisions of the of the uh, train. Um, and um, actually, what what we will be um, showcasing this afternoon will be two papers, uh, the IDS papers. Um, to highlight the Duterte Administration's Tax Reform Program, which has been enacted into law um, otherwise known as the TRAIN Act. And it amended the um, structure of the personal income tax, um, value-added tax, and excise tax on petroleum products, cigarettes, uh, automobiles, sweet and beverages, food, coke, and mineral products. So um, our two speakers will be um, discussing this afternoon how these changes in the tax rates will impact on um, the different sectors, as well as um, discuss the equity implications, as well as the um, um, additional, if there would be additional resources to be able to fund our Build, Build, Build program, as well as the government's expanded uh, social protection um, program. So we're looking forward to your active participation in this afternoon, in, in today's seminar. Um, so again, welcome to PIDS. So we have, as mentioned by our president, we will have two speakers, one of which is Dr. Uh, Philip Lano. Um, so we are now ready to hear your presentation. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Reyes, uh, uh, participants of this forum, so thank you very much no, for coming. Uh, so I'll be presenting my paper on assessing the train coal and petroleum excise taxes, well, which is not really on only on coal and uh, petroleum excise taxes eventually, you know, based on the discussions that we have in, the, uh, in, in revising the paper. So this is a paper that I did with a few others, Dr. Trente, CJ Castillo, Marjan Buidon, and Mian uh, Pumano. So as of course, I think everyone already knows the context no, of, of train, no? and I'll just do a brief review and then I'll discuss uh, what they did. No? So the objective uh, of my paper is just to analyze what are the, uh, the uh, economic, no? uh, welfare, no? and environmental effects of, of train, no? and then show you some results and some uh, conclusions. No? Okay. So I think as, as all of us know, no, the government is uh, implementing um, been posting and also legislating, uh, and also, also legislated uh, the tax reform, legislation, and inclusion. And it has um, this is composed already of several packages, and uh, I think uh, the packages, uh, the package one A, has already been legislated. And the initial estimates is that uh, government is expected to collect around 600 to 800 billion pesos no, over the next several years no, in additional uh, revenues no, to fund. Um, uh, include critical no? uh, infrastructure and uh, social service projects and programs. No? So uh, we know that uh, Claim 1A no, under RA 10916, no? which was just uh, which was passed in December 2017, uh, covers actually the many uh, provisions, no? reforms in the in taxes, no? so including uh, the changes in personal income tax, no? changes in excise tax, the broadening of value added taxes. No? Lowering estate and owner's taxes, the taxation of cosmetic procedures, changes in income no, on foreign currency and long-term deposits, changes in excise tax reporting and earmarking of government revenues to this infrastructure and social protection programs. So under the, the law, under the pack, under package one, no, so the change in personal income tax, no, just for us to remember, you know, include the following. Yeah. 
as of earlier as I said, on the keys we felt it going further income taxes uh, just this month. No? So it's one is just to reduce the uh, income tax brackets now from seven to six now with a marginal tax rates now from zero to thirty five and the uh, highest income tax bucket actually having an income greater than eight pesos. So the removal of personal and additional exemptions and self-employed professionals, no? uh, many of us, many of some or some of us are here, are given the choice now to pay a graduated, a graduated income tax or a flat 8% cost of seats, uh, 8% of uh, cost of seats uh, under the bank. Also, we know that uh, the bank threshold has also moved up other uh, broadening the uh, value of the tax, also being what of the bills or the law, the bills uh, 54 out of 61 special laws that actually are deemed non essential or goods that actually are uh, being back exempt. No? That, uh, sorry, that are essential uh, back exemptions and goods that remain actually that are back exempt are those purchased by senior citizens and persons with disability. Uh, housing uh, with cost below two million as exempt from uh, VAT beginning in 2021. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have medicines no, for diabetes, um, cholesterol, hypertension are exempt beginning 2019. And their own exemptions no, from paying VAT no, under the law are firms with gross sales of three million or lower, uh, you know, government owned and controlled corporations. No, State universities and colleges and government agencies, and also the personal and also the effects of those coming from abroad under certain conditions. Under the excess taxes, there are also upward adjustments on excess taxes on petroleum products, coal, uh, coke, automobiles, and sugar sweetened beverages. Okay, so the question the objective of the study originally that, that we did was to actually look at uh, the effects of changes in the excess tax on, uh, that on coal and petroleum. Uh, especially on energy generation and the environment. But uh, during the course no, of undertaking the study, you know, um, uh, we also included some additional scenarios for the good pain on aid packages, including the impacts on sector output and household atmosphere. So the methodology that we use is a uh, what is called a, uh, as a computable general equilibrium model. So it's a model that tries, I'll explain a little bit about the model in one. Which is actually a uh, numerically consistent, uh, which uses a uh, consistent database no, of, uh, uh, of of data, um, and it's linked to uh, as a micro in micro counting household emissions uh, databases. No? So it's, it's a database, it's a representation of the whole economy, which is linked to some databases related to household, no? uh, particularly the family income expenditure survey and also uh, the emission database. So the five data set now was assembled uh, from the following sources. Now the social accounting matrix, which is the main database now from, for the model, no, comes from the 2012 input output table, the national income accounts, the balance of payments, and fiscal accounts data. The also model in which we will simulate changes in welfare no, comes from the 2015 family income expenditure service, so not the model but the survey. So the input output table actually was actually adjusted now for 2015 uh, figures and then we used that not to, and link that with uh, 2015 family income expenditure survey. The emission uh, multipliers uh, that are used now are the, uh, there's a global database of emissions now, uh, coming from the Global Data Analysis Project, uh, which actually stores uh, global data no, on uh, trade, uh, energy, and, and so on. No? And uh, for tax data no, to, to, to simulate the changes in excess taxes, no, we have data from the National Tax Research Center the Department of Finance. So, so the reference year actually is 2015, although the GTAP data on emissions is actually on 2011. So the assessment of changes in the tax rate were undertaken economy wide. So, in a sense, we're using this model because we know that. Any change in taxes will not have only one single effect. There will be uh, what is called, uh, uh, there will be several effects so that will actually occur in the economy because of changes in the tax rate. So if there's a change, for example, if there's a change in the tax on consumer good, this raises the price of the good and reduces the demand for the good. No? And this would, of course, have an effect on firm production and therefore also in the, uh, in also the demand for uh, labor and capital, which is needed by the, by the firm. No? 
and it will also affect also certain investment decisions. So there's uh, there are secondary effects of whatever changes in taxes that occur, and these effects actually are uh, are felt not well the, the economy. So the advantage of this modeling procedure that it measures the ultimate impact of these policies. Um, and the tax reform here is are introduced as uh, shocks to the balance. So there's a consistent, the, the economy is modeled no, uh, uh, in a consistent, uh, there's, there's a data that's modeled, um, that's, um, that's in, what, what we call as in equilibrium parameter. It, it, the, the data it actually fits the, whatever data that we have in terms of uh, our macroeconomic data. But let's say there's a shock no, in the system. No? So what happens now to all of these balances that actually occur in the economy? So a counterfactual equilibrium is actually computed on reflecting these changes. No? And the differences in actually the values of these economic variables no, between the two general economic equilibria. So the, the state first we're in, you just have the uh, balance no, without the shock, no, without the change in, in policy or, or the change in taxes. No? And one, the balance now that occurs with the change in taxes now are regarded as the impacts of the reform. So the methodology is actually uh, ex ante simulation of the effects of this policy reform. So therefore, it's not a statistical projection. So do not claim that these simulations are statistical projections. The changes, no, but these are just ex ante uh, assessments. No? So before the policy is implemented, what do we see actually are the, are the changes. No? So, the database no, for, for this data no, comes from represents the following uh, components of the economy. So, so uh, 44 productive activities, no, agriculture, industry, uh, services, no, uh, energy composite no, with uh, power transmission and, and sources of power generation. So the income data is not coming from the family income expenditure survey. Uh, factors of production. No, uh, um, of skilled and uh, skilled capital, which is used in the production process. No? Um, institutions no, in, uh, in the economy uh, representing the government, no? uh, financial intermediaries, no? the, the banking system, no? business enterprises, and, uh, and the, what is called as the rest of the world, so outside of the Philippines. No? Then the economy here you know, is modeled as a small open economy that domestic sector prices no, actually do not influence the world price. So this is just an illustration of what it happens. So we have a policy change. Uh, so this is here in the sort of facts counterfactual. And what if there's any change you know, that will actually perturb or change the uh, the balances that are occurring in the economy. And then whatever changes in production output there also or the change in factor income, meaning that well factor incomes here are the factors of production like labor and capital, and if there are changes in sort of the what we call as returns or the wage, no, or the returns to income, there will be some change and also change in commodity prices. So there will be a change in welfare at the household level. No? So that's uh, that's the, that's how this uh, methodology actually works. And if there's any change in production output, that will change the uh, certain values, no, in the emissions accounting uh, model. So. Okay, so that's uh, how, it's, how it, this is done. So the sector price changes and changes in factor income so affect actually uh, income across households. No? In the fam we use the whole family income, the, I think there are 40,000 uh, households in the family income expenditure survey. So we, we get the data no, primarily relating to changes in wages no? or changes in entrepreneurial income no? from the uh, from the macroeconomic model no, and then link it now to the, uh, to the, to the household model no, and, and see whatever changes that actually occur. And the project utilization of some uh, carbon dioxide multipliers, that's the only data that we have in terms of emission no, coming from the GTAP uh, uh, emissions database. No. So, so we undertake in this paper, you know, uh, the paper that is already available, I think, in the PID's website, but these scenarios. So one is uh, a scenario where you just have changes in excise in petroleum and coal. So we do a sort of calculation of what is the change in the tax rate. So if, let's say if it's from 1% to 2%, so that will represent 100% change in the taxes. So we do that calculation. So we look at the different commodities, uh, and then what are the estimated shock 
changes in tax rates no, for excise no, for each of the 44 sectors. So if, if any, no, of course, no, excise tax only covers some of these sectors. So mining, uh, coal, crude oil, and then petroleum. So we estimate them using the, uh, the, 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 the changes in taxes according to the, to the law, no, the, you know, you, the dirty, but there's a change in. What is the change in uh, tax from this value to this value? Then we uh, do some estimation of what is the change in the excess tax. So that's the first scenario that we have. The second scenario is uh, we now include all of the major components of train one. So we include the uh, changes in personal income tax, so the change in effective tax rates by in income decile, the change in excise tax structure, you know, uh, going beyond uh, petroleum and coal, so including beverages, tobacco, transport equipment, and automobile, and then broadening of the value at the tax. So we look at all of the uh, removal of zero, uh, we'll, the, the zero rated and back exempt transactions. So we look at all of these products and try to classify them according to whatever commodity and industry that they are. So uh, then we calculate whatever the percentage change is. So I'm not, because uh, there, there are changes in all 44 of the sectors, so I will not uh, show the table, but if some of you are interested, I can uh, send you the table. So this is the calculated change in the personal income tax. So we, we make some assumptions on what is the wage income and entrepreneurial income of each of the households that are present. No? And then we calculate uh, whatever tax revenue that we get from, uh, so we, we estimate what is the income, the for each of the income decimals in the, the FIES. So we calculate their estimated income per decile. Then we calculate, uh, based on the uh, tax table, what is the estimated uh, uh, taxes no, that uh, each of the households no, have. So then we just sum up that for each of the income decimals. No? So, uh, the effective rates no, uh, are, are, are least listed. So, and, and, the, and the one in the last uh, column is our estimate no, of the percentage change no, uh, from the uh, from the uh, because of the ta changes in taxes no, of, of, of this different income decimals. No. And then uh, our last scenario, because this was addressed when we presented this uh, internally to kids, but to include also. Uh, a scenario in which uh, what if down there are transfers now to households? I think the, uh, the recent there's this a um, the DSW released the guidelines now for the provision of the unconditional cash transfer, not giving the added pesos not to the bottom 50 percent. No? And then we try to simulate the uh, changes that the changes that will occur given that each household no, in the lowest five income deciles no, are now provided with. Uh, with this uh, cash subsidy uh, for each household. Okay, then we have, uh, so what are now the results no, of our uh, simulation? So, so we simulated this in, in terms of all of these 44 sectors, no, uh, the output, the uh, supply, no, both domestic and imported, no? uh, although later I'll show you it's uh, really the domestic supply is actually both. So the prices, no? The returns to uh, to factors, the production factors. No? Um, we calculated also change in what is called in economics as uh, equivalent variation. No? So, what would happen to the income if the policy actually did not uh, occur? Uh, the poverty account index. So, using the family income expenditure survey, you know, we have some data also the emissions and. Although this is not in our paper, <laughs> uh, this is a side collect calculation that we did. No? Uh, on what is now the impact on government revenue no, of all of these uh, changes. No. And these are the results. No. Under the, so again, just, just for us to remember, there are three main scenarios that we calculated for. The first is the, just a change in the petroleum and coal excise taxes. No. Second is the, petroleum, the whole train package. And the third scenario is the train plus the unconditional cash transfer, no, which is also part of the train. No. So, in terms of uh, sector output, apologies no, for my voice, no, I'm not feeling well the past few days. No. Uh, there's a actually slight decline in the uh, first scenario. No. So, but output prices under the plane scenario. So, what our simulations actually show no, that the plane one is favorable to the agricultural sector. No. So, at least the second in the second scenario. No. 
And this is most likely you know, coming from increased consumer demand and uh, due to higher disposable income. Remember in the plain one, there's a reduction in personal income taxes, no? especially if, uh, well, for all, I mean, for, in, in the table that we have for all, uh, for all uh, income decimals. No? Uh, and, and because of this, no? uh, output actually rises. No? Uh, and because the agriculture sector is the one that is least affected by all of these thing changes, no? we see a rise no, in the agriculture sector output. So in the first scenario, the, uh, the uh, coal and petroleum suffers from a slight decline in second output, but there's a large decline, of course, no, in the beverage, chemicals, and engine manufacturing under clean water. Um, so our estimate actually in terms of the increase in aggregate output no, uh, in, in these three scenarios, no, so there are changes no, by each sector. No. Um, in the first scenario, because it's just an increase in petroleum and coal excise taxes, no, so what will happen is that um, there will be a decline in aggregate output by around 1%, but under claim 1, no, because of the increase in consumption, no, our, our estimate is that it will is by around 2.3%, no? and with additional uh, with traditional cash transfer, no? around 2.6%. No? Uh, of course, no, fuel, uh, fossil fuel generating, generating plants, no? uh, output no, decline under the petroleum and coal excise tax scenario that they cover under claim 1, and claim 1 plus uh, traditional cash transfer. So for the tables, you just have this. No? So in terms of the agricultural sectors, we see a general improvement no? under uh, uh, so, uh, uh, agriculture sector actually fares relatively well under train no? and higher their higher demand for crops no? because of their income. It's, 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 uh, but uh, many industrial sectors actually uh, suffer, no? uh, mainly also due to the large, uh, due to the excess, ta well, the excess taxes that were imposed. No? Uh, um, so you see a large drop in beverage and tobacco, no? uh, and then engine products actually drop no, due to their linkage no, with the mining and uh, coal output no, because of excess taxes. No? So most industrial sectors so show slight declines, but there are also modest improvements no, in some sectors like um, goods, uh, sorry, uh, food manufacturing no, outside of beverages, um, uh, sugar manufacturing, and also garments. No? For uh, services, no, it's relatively mixed, no, with some sectors actually um, doing well, but um, there's some, like uh, finance, no, for example, or telecommunications. No, that, that can help with it. So under the first scenario, uh, coal and gas generate electricity generation declines, no, but under pain one uh, and pain one, uh, as you see, the fossil fuel generation actually further increases. Okay, in terms of supply, no, uh, what happens? No, so this is now combined domestic output and, and imported uh, goods. No, so the agricultural supply also, no, uh, because of the increase in domestic production, show an increase, no, same trend as the domestic output. No, same trend also for the domestic supply, no, uh, mainly caused by a decline in many of the industrial uh, sectors. No. And then uh, also supply in the services sectors are generally mixed. So there are gains for telecoms, finance, and other sectors. So that's for supply. In terms of sector prices, so there's a significant increase in petroleum prices and gas generation plants no, under the first scenario. No, and of course, no, plants for services no, which use a lot of uh, also fuel, no, uh, which is now tax, no, uh, petroleum is now tax. No. Uh, their prices actually rise. No? Beverage and tobacco no? uh, have the largest rise in terms of central price, and uh, crude oil and also petroleum prices also uh, also further rise in the thing in one scenario, the second scenario. Electricity prices uh, um, rise by around 3 to 4 percent under thing one, and 4 to 5 percent under thing one as the substitute. So, in general, no? Uh, if you just, uh, we try to, given all of these changes in sectoral prices, no, we try to compute using the consumer price uh, indices weights. No? So what will be now be the change in uh, aggregate prices? No? So the change uh, in terms of the first scenario will be around 1%, no? but uh, in plain one, no, um, the increase will be around 
So here's just some uh, representation of all of these changes in uh, prices. So under agriculture, we see an increase in uh, agriculture uh, sector prices. No? Uh, industrial, most also of the industrial uh, sectors, we see a decline in a little, uh, well, a decline in some of the sectors, but most uh, industrial sectors will see an increase. <coughs> And for uh, services uh, industries, no, prices no, actually will, will generally increase. Okay. Uh, so, that, so, so that's for output, supply, and then uh, prices. No? For welfare, no, so the change in welfare that we usually calculate under these types of uh, methodologies no, is uh, measured in terms of what is known as uh, the equivalent valuation or the change in income that uh, would occur if the consumer's utilities was equal to the level that would occur if the event had uh, happened. Under the first scenario, the highest income actually suffered uh, the greatest no, because of the relatively large share of petroleum or in their uh, consumption basket. No? Under the plain one scenario, however, the higher income deciles actually gain uh, because of the, the, the Increase uh, the personal income taxes no? uh, in terms of nominal values are very large no? among these uh, very high well, among these uh, uh, in households no? the highest income deciles no? under the there's some improvement among the lower income deciles in terms of the I mean if you now provide now you, you cash transfer uh, but their um, but they do not still gain, no? even with the unconditional cash answer. Again, we do not, um, there was a suggestion when we were undertaking this study you know, to include the effects of infrastructure. No? Unfortunately, we're not able to do this uh, in, in, in this study. Uh, by the way, we, in our simulations, we calculated the, uh, because the increase in taxes, no? uh, personal income tax, no? uh, some of the excess taxes, no? we, uh, it will be is graduated. No? So we calculated the what is called as the end game, no? the, the, 20, the last stage no, of the increase. No? We do not uh, have, uh, we do not calculate the graduated increase, but no? what happens actually towards the end. No? So the change in, well, in the first um, scenario, no, you see a decline in the equivalent valuation for all households, so of course, uh, because they they will face higher prices no, because of increased petroleum and coal taxes. No? Uh, what happens is under claim one and in the unconditional cash transfer, no? uh, it's the lower seven income deciles actually that uh, are still lose up, no? uh, uh, even with the, with the uh, uh, unconditional cash transfer. So that's uh, something that uh, they also want to discuss and also Okay, in terms of the, what is called as factor returns, so changes in uh, wages uh, will gain from this. So most of the labor dominance as we modeled it in our database are so in skilled labor. Uh, the returns to unskilled labor and uh, capital actually declines under the first scenario. But under the pain one scenario, it's actually the return to capital that has the lowest increase. Okay, in terms of poverty headcount, we were asked also during the study to maybe calculate also some of the changes in, in poverty, you know, given that there's a change in you know, all of these taxes. No? And from our, I mean, just simulating it, simulating all of these changes now using the family income expenditure survey, you know, we see uh, in the first scenario uh, generally a small uh, increase uh, in uh, poverty incidence. Uh, uh, we try to calibrate this to the uh, poverty incidence as calculated also by the uh, Philippine Statistics Authority you know, for, for, for these sectors. No? Uh, but under day one, because of uh, these additional uh, uh, taxes that we have, uh, poverty incidence will increase more. But uh, of course, no, the, the increase is offset by the unconditional cash transfer, but still. Uh, for some of the sectors, except for transport workers, because transport workers, they're, uh, they're very close to the poverty line. So any increase lang in their uh, uh, in income or subsidy, uh, it will actually uh, improve uh, their welfare. So there's a general decline in the poverty incidence of 
transport, uh, transportation workers. So the uh, traditional cash transfer actually increases, uh, offset the increase in poverty incidence across the different sectors. So, but still, uh, there's a slight uh, How about in terms of emissions? Again, uh, we use a global database, and uh, because we have to calculate changes in uh, emissions sector by sector, I mean, this is a 44 sector. Database. Of course, under the, the volume and coal uh, excise tax uh, uh, scenario, you know, because of the lower output, especially coming from the uh, power generation uh, plants, and also the impact also on trans transportation uh, services, no? the uh, carbon dioxide emissions will decline. But again, no, under the train one, in the train one, plus additional transfer scenario actually slightly uh, increased now because of increased uh, economic activity. Uh, this is not in our paper, but uh, we did a side calculation on the effect on uh, government revenues. No? And uh, what actually we have, uh, at least in terms of how calculated it now, the plain one actually shows that there will be a significant decline. So this is using the NTRC data. No? Um, they will have a significant decline in personal income tax, and of course, so this will be partially offset by the increase in excise taxes. No, but still, it uh, the how it offsets the uh, the taxes. I mean, will not is is not uh, the, the excise taxes will not really fully offset the decline in uh, in uh, the decline in income taxes. So I think this is something that maybe we want to also uh, watch out. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, we know that uh, excess tax and, uh, on petroleum and coal have slight adverse impacts on households so by changing both uh, prices and uh, factor compensation that changes in uh, HS. But however, these taxes actually reduce slightly you know, carbon emissions in the country, so that's uh, not much. But nevertheless, the whole thing, I think what's, uh, what it shows uh, the, in terms of pain, you know, it has a positive impact no, on aggregate output, especially on the agricultural sector. So, but we know that the train one shifts uh, taxation now to indirect taxes no, because of the changes in all of these taxes. No. But anything what has to just be uh, uh, monitored no, is that, uh, at least based on our uh, simulations, no, that the greater uh, collections no, may not really offset the decline in personal and, uh, in personal and corporate tax. So, and this is something that uh, we have to Claim no. um, uh, one also affects uh, may affect the poor households, especially in terms of negative negative uh, equivalent valuation. But the additional cash transfer will partially reverse this uh, negative uh, equivalent valuation and increase in poverty account. But we know that, uh, of course, so there's a this is just the tax side. But uh, hopefully this will be mitigated by the uh, expenditure side. So whatever I think. Uh, Policymakers now have to be mindful now that uh, whatever generate uh, revenues that are generated uh, can actually we should alleviate no, uh, the poor and vulnerable sectors, not only those actually below the poverty line. No? Uh, but the target initially of the unconditional cash transfers, you know, uh, I think, is the lowest five um, in town vessels, but also I think, I mean, at least based on the simulations that we have, maybe it's also good to think of programs no, that will actually help no, the um, lowest no, uh, seven income taxes. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for that uh, very informative and comprehensive presentation, Dr. Twino. Please reserve your questions about Dr. Twino's presentation for the open forum later. Now we are ready to listen to the presentation of Dr. Rosario Manson. Marshall. Yeah. Uh, 
October, so I have forgotten all about this. <laughs> Things are doing other things right now. So let me, this is the overview of the PowerPoint presentation, but let me skip the initial, the first few slides because I just made this class. So it's just talking about tax reform. Now, let me start with the components of RA 10963, or the plain law, as actually enacted. Um, just the first five of these components were included in the original DOF proposal. The last four uh, found their way in the law as the proposals went through Congress. And I think that's very important to point out. Okay, so uh, the excise tax on sweetened beverages, the increase in the excise tax on cigarettes, excise tax on coal and coke, uh, and then increase in documentary stamp tax on various transactions, which we, you know, people don't talk about. And according to my friends in the banking se sector, this is quite substantial. And actually, if you go back to the original sort of uh, reasoning, those entire uh, tax reform, the package four talks about rationalization of financial sector taxation. And the, the essence of the uh, package four is really to lighten or well first remove the distortionary impact of financial sector transaction yung iba ibang tax rates on different financial instruments but also to lessen the friction so by developing capital market but here we're talking of documentary stamp tax so that's substantial now for you to um, sources in the banking sector. But anyway, um, just to differentiate the analysis done here, this is strictly partial equilibrium. But I think listening to the presentation, largely consistent um, <coughs> conclusions from the law. The two papers are largely consistent. So, PIT provisions under the plain law, graduated rate schedule with marginal rates that varies from 0% to 35%, adjusted income tax bracket such that you have lower marginal tax rates being applicable to um, comparable annual taxable levels. So, talagang bumaba in tax. For, especially for uh, compensation income earners. So compensation income earners, the tax base is modified gross income, meaning wala na mga deductions, so no personal exemptions. Uh, tax rate is based on a graduated rate schedule with six brackets instead of seven uh, under the old regime. 0% tax on income not over 250,000 versus 5% on taxable income not over 10,000. But the top marginal tax rate is 35% applicable to income above 8 million versus 32% applicable to taxable income levels above 500,000. Uh, for self-employed and or professionals, the tax base is net income. As before, the tax rate will vary. The applicable tax rate will vary depending on the gross sales receipts. For steps uh, with gross sales receipts in excess of that threshold, the tax is, the graduated tax rate schedule is applied to the net income. But for 
accepts withdraw sales receipts below the VAT threshold, they are given the option to pay 8% of their gross sales receipts as a final tax, and then, or to pay on the basis of a graduated rate schedule. Now, this last thing here is very important because in the initial proposals that were submitted to Congress, uh, a small uh, SEPs, meaning SEPs with low income, were not given that option. And the problem there is that if your uh, profit margin is low, uh, example, you operate a calendaria or you're a small store owner, self-employed, entrepreneur, um, you are likely to be taxed higher compared to those na nandun sa almost near the bracket. The consultants, the independent consultants are the biggest gainer here. So, kung wala yung option na yan, there would be a lot of horizontal inequity. Um, this shows you the implications of the income tax provisions, personal income tax pro provision of RA 1063 on the absolute tax burden by decile and then the revenue take. On the average, uh, the train law reduced the liability of corporate uh, of compensation income earners in all deciles and higher forget that one. I was doing it when I was in the car, sorry. Um, <laughs> on the average, uh, train law reduced the income, the tax liability of compensation income earners across all their sides. Uh, the biggest gainer here are the compensation income tax earner in the highest in the higher deciles. You, if you look at this column here, in fact, you will see that under It will reduce PIP liability of CIPs in all the asylums in the first year of implementation, but higher income tax liability of SEPs in the lower decile in the first year. Um, Those earning over 
12 million almost per year. So that excludes most of us. In fact, from 2023 onwards, compensation income earners will pay lower income tax compared to the old regime regardless of their taxable income. So lahat, lahat na compensation income earners. For SEPs, it is forced, the, the tax, the train law is forced high in terms of providing the same tax treatment to see of similarly situated individuals by allowing SEPs with gross receipts below the trust, bad thresholds to pay the 8% tax based on gross receipts or to compute their tax liability. by applying the graduated rate schedule to their net income tax. The absence of these options under the proposals that went through Congress actually results in extreme horizontal inequity. So that's a good move. Overall, uh, the papers estimates of the revenue impact of the train loan is a loss of 210 billion in 2018, 223 billion in 2019 to 2022, and 238 billion in 2023. This is, by the way, much higher than the estimated revenue loss from the personal income tax reform uh, as per the Department of Finance. So, uh, by the way, these estimates were arrived at by using the Family Income Expenditure Survey and applying a tax calculator to every observation there, as if they were filing their income tax returns. And then calibrating the tax state based on a collection efficiency. Okay. The average EPR on compensation income is expected to go down from 5.4% under the old regime to 1.1% in 2018 to 2022 and 0.9% in 2023 onwards under the train law. For SEPs, the EPR is expected to go down to from 1.7 to 0 0.8 and then 0 0.7. So, pareho kung bababa. But, yung effective tax rate. So, in, in a sense, everybody happy. But the reduction is greater for compensation income earners than for the SEPs as a group. Uh, the gap in the average EPR of compensation income earners and the self-employed is projected to narrow. However, the average EPR of self-employed and professionals is projected, um, apologies for the typos, to continue to be lower than that of CIEs from 2023 onwards. This is a positive development as this will likely improve their tax compliance. Kasi yung uh, ETRs to SEPs. Take note that the self-employed and the professionals are notorious um, in terms of avoiding, evading payment of taxes. Winners and losers from uh, individual income tax reform under the trade law. Uh, this table shows you the change in the tax burden in peso terms, negative for all income deciles under RA 10963 from 2019 onward, but positive for deciles 1 to 6 in 2018. Meaning, last year talaga, you poorest six deciles, kawawa kawawa. Dahil, they were paying more taxes on 
na ko. Sa income pa lang, ha? Wala pa yung tama, no? A higher petroleum product taxes. Biggest gains projected to accrue to compensation income earners below, belonging to the richest decile, who as a group received the largest share in the total reduction in peak burden and to experience the largest reduction uh, in their peak tax liability expressed as a percentage of their taxable income. Steps from the poorest decile expected to gain the least from the train law, having the lowest reduction in their ETRs and the lowest share in total fit burden expressed in nominal terms. So terms. The bottom line is that the direction of the individual income tax reform is not pro poor. That's the bottom line. Um, lahat bumaba ang tax, pero mas mabilis yung pagbaba. No richer, upper income decides. Implication of bad provisions under RA 10963, um, bad threshold increased from 1.9 million to 3 million, some expansion in the bad base, remove that exemption of sale of low cost housing, meaning those um, above 2 million, yun na tayo nasa IRR. Restricted VAT exemption of lease of residential property to those with monthly rental not exceeding, not exceeding 15,000 per month. Remove zero rating of sale of raw materials or packaging, raw materials, packaging materials to export-oriented industries whose export sales exceed 70%. In other words, you indirect exporters. Uh, until uh, conditional on having a more effective VAT refund system. Pag daw meron ng effective VAT refund system, wala na zero rating yung indirect exporters operating outside of the export process and so forth. That's the bottom line. Kanina, um, the, early, the previous speaker talks about expanding the tax base by remove, uh, because the law removes 54 something. That huge number. <laughs> to me, what appears to me as a huge number of exemptions. Honestly, I've read and reread the three law. Hindi ko mahanap yung katanggal na bad exemptions, na gano'ng karami. I, I, not, I, I, I saw that on the DOF website. Pero hindi ko talaga siya mahanap, honestly. So if somebody would like to show us what the 54 are. Because ito lang yung parang nandun talaga sa train law na nabak na kita ko. Um, kasi yung original proposals, they were talking about uh, wala nang exception yung cooperatives, pero hindi naman po masayon. Uh, in fact, sa bagong kayo, no, nandun nga yung uh, back exemption ng uh, uh, medication for diabetes, cholesterol, etc., which, which is not in the old tax code, pero bago yun. Pero that's an Erosion of the tax base, in a sense. Okay, anyway. So, an implication of, on revenue, my estimate is really low, 15.5%. Less than half of the original trade proposals. Kasi nga, maraming exemption dun sa previews as proposed na hindi naman na carry out. At, Impact on in tax incidents, change in VAT EPR due to the train law rises with household per capita income from deciles 1 to 9. So, but uh, actually, yung effective 
ultimately, for the poorest, is the highest for all their sides. So, in some sense, pag exclude mo yung poorest decile, progressive siya. But when you include the poorest decile, it's not so clear na progressive yung pag-remove etong, etong bad provisions. Now, let me talk about excise tax on petroleum product. Ito siya. On revenue, based on kung mag-retain mag ng 2015 demand, 51 billion. In 2018, 87.5. In 2019, 130 billion. 2020. Onwards, if you compare this to the earlier three proposals, mas front-loaded. Kasi doon sa old proposals, uh, mas maliit yung pagtaas ng tax sa 2018, and then mas mas malaki sa 2019-2020. So, mas front-loaded yung uh, train law itself. Now, on incidents, change in tax burden as percent of house, household income increases as household income rises in deciles 2 to 9. And change in excise tax burden of poorest deciles even higher than those of 2, 3, and 4 deciles. Uh, deciles 2, 3, and 4. Again, yung, it's not so clear na siya ay progressive. Sometimes kasi uh, when we just read the newspapers, they say, uh, it's not so bad. You should not worry so much about in, the increases in petroleum product taxes because sino ba ang tinatamaan ng pag-increase nun yung may mga kotse o yung may yaman. But that's not so clear from the data because, because in fact, ang laki ng tama sa pulis desay. Impact on inflation, this became very, very controversial. Uh, sa public debate mo last year. <coughs> uh, other things being equal, ex ante estimate, uh, CPI is estimated to increase by half a percent in 2018 and an additional 0.4% in 2019. Now, unfortunately kasi, di ba, a lot of discussion, and as the inflation last year, and a lot of the discussion there is, ah, yung, yung non-government sector, I don't know who. So a lot of news came out na sabi nila, well, this the increase in the inflation, dahil yan, the increase in petroleum product taxes. Um, and I think part of the discussion nangyari because it's not clear kung ano ba, saan ba natin binabase yung baseline. This estimates, doon sa cash, in the, the 0.5%, that's based on before and after. Meaning, and the before is really December 31, 2018. So, diba? So, ano yung baseline mo? Ano yung or a new reference point of the increase. Eh, yung mga reports on inflation is a year on year. Diba? Or month on month. So, so the question is, what is the contribution of the increase in the excess tax and petroleum products to inflation? There is on the period being studied. If you're just looking between December 31, 2018 and say March 31, 2018, uh, my estimate is that 44% of the increase in CPI due to the excise tax, the increase in the excise tax. And the rest due to other factors. The Bukisa na dyan kasi shoot up yung world price of petroleum, like uh, depreciate your peso, so all that contributes. But when you're looking at the increase in CPI between December 31, 2018 and say May 13, 
2019, yung, yung increase in CPI is just uh, the share of, the contribution rather, of excise tax increase is just 21%. Kasi one off lang naman yun, at least for 2018, diba? one off lang yung change in price on petrol. Should the baseline be 31 December 2017 because, uh, ah. because already implemented in 2018. Okay. That's a typo. So it's 2017 and then 2018. You're correct. I'm sorry, sir. So you just changed the years. So it's when December 31, 2017 and March 31. Thank you for pointing that out. March 31, 2018 and then and so on. So on economic efficiency, the argument is that likely to reduce road congestion and pollution, likely to reduce use of relatively more uh, polluted fuel as tax on diesel increases from zero. Excise tax on automobiles. This is a comparative increase in the tax rate. Take note that the increase in excise tax on automobiles for cars that whose Net selling price do not exceed 600,000. Uh, the tax is expected to rise from two or is uh, will rise uh, increase from two percent to four percent, double. But when you look at the more expensive cars, the increase in the tax declines from a high of 400 percent to a low of almost zero as the net selling price of cars goes down, or rather goes up from 600,000 to 1.6 million. And, and from 21 to zero percent as the net selling price falls, or goes up rather, between 1.6 and 4 million. In other words, habang kumakahal yung koche, bumababa yung increase in the tax. I'm not saying bumaba yung tax, but you increase in the tax is smaller as the cars for more expensive cars. Now, having you take 13 billion as per DOF, I could not come up with an independent estimate because we don't have enough data. On incidence, incidence of the increase expected to make the tax less progressive than before. I say you lower price cars are actually the increase in the tax of the lower price cars are is higher than that of the more expensive cars. But I think what to me is very worrisome here is the likely negative impact on the cars program. Uh, which is the pro which is concerned really with domestic production of uh, cars priced at about six hundred thousand. And there are two. I, I know for Mitsubishi, the, they have enrolled the Mirage as one of those uh, under the cars, and then Toyota also. Bios, right? You low end, not even the high end of Bios, but the low end of Bios. Um, one may argue na bakit mo pa ipopromote yung cars, ang tagal-tagal na yung car industry, hindi na yan impact, etc. But the point is whether we agree or not do sa cars program, it is there. Nandun na siya, nakumpisahan na siya. Investors have come in. And I think this move speaks against yung policy consistency. So, so to me, major problematic siya from uh, FDI point of view. Kasi parang very unstable yung policy. 
industrial policy. Okay. Excise tax on sweetened beverage as per DOF, about 50 billion per year. Uh, we found the tax to be mildly regressive, uh, meaning tax liability due from each income decide declines as per capita household income decreases, meaning the poorer households are paying more relative to their income. On economic incentives, the advantage is it's likely to discourage consumption of sweetened beverage, beverages which has been associated with health risks like diabetes and obesity. Now, in other countries, I think, if I remember right, Mexico has, was one of the first to impose a tax on sweetened beverage. They say, uh, at least Manila may impact evaluation and positive view effect on reducing consumption. So on that note, Muhang okay. But a disadvantage that it might hurt, hurt the poor who rely on some of these products as a cheap source of calories. Uh, and then this, there's this discussion on our regard, well, one of one noted economist said, uh, well, bakit mo siya itatax? Problema ng individual kung gusto niya. Kasi siya naman yung magkakasakit, siya naman yung magbabayad sa hospital. Because the argument is, there's no negative externality. So that's one argument. Totoo din naman yun, kung if, if, individuals are the one actually shouldering the health cost in terms of hospitalization, buying medicine, etc. But in the Philippines, the burden of non-communicable diseases is borne by taxpayers in general to the extent that the majority of less well-off population rely on the public health system and to the extent that government, national government finances the indigent program of the field health. So at the bottom line, who pays for the health costs of these non-communicable diseases is the general taxpayer. So we, meron, to that extent, meron the negative externality to the general population. And so maybe, so that is a counter argument to the non-negative externality argument. Whether which one has greater weight is something that perhaps future PIDS study can work out. Um, the other taxes, but I didn't have the time to, to do that. Now, when I was writing this paper, what happened you hindi pa available yung actual revenue collection data. Oh, what I have at that point was BIR and BOC collections from the BTR as of October 2018. The table shows you the ex ante estimates of revenue impact from the different taxes for the different provisions of the train law. So that's the papers ex ante estimate. But this discussion here on the left, what I'm trying to show there is, okay, I said, those were ex ante projections. Now we have, as of October 2018, some indication of what the actual revenue take is from all these changes in the tax code. And, and so I looked at uh, the revenue, you know, based on January to October 
October 2018, my conclusion at the time was that the two agencies likely to fall short of their collection targets for the entire two year of 2018 by a combined total of 88 billion. So in short, in the positive new overall revenue impact of trade. Because if you look at, say, the DBMs, BESF, they break down sila nung ano yung expected revenue from each type of task. So in particular, actual revenue from the PID is likely to be lower than its 2018 target by 43 billion based on actual January to October 2018, which suggests that the revenue loss from the individual tax reform may actually be closer to 190 billion, larger than the DOF's 146 billion estimate, but higher than this paper's 210 billion estimate. Then, And then the next con overall conclusion of the paper is if you look at all the different uh, taxes from PIT, changes in the tax code uh, on the burden of the tax, the overall conclusion is that the overall distributional impact of the train law is regressive when one abstracts from the proposed targeted, uh, untargeted subsidies under the program. So that's one. So it's regressive abstracting from the unconditional cash transfers. Ah, uh, and then I provided the numbers. But the other point I think that I want to point out is that, yes, the, the government said it will provide unconditional cash transfers. From what I know, you unconditional cash transfers for the poor and in the four piece, the big ayon late na di ba March. And there are even reports that as late as September, some households included in the four piece have not received the unconditional cash transfers. Uh, and the unconditional cash transfers is given ano ba yun? Pures 20? Pures 50 percent? Oh, that's, that's the intent. 50% dapat yung bibigay. But what I'm saying is, as far, ang nabibigyan pa lang na for sure is late na yung 4 is. And the 4 is is not the poorest 50%. It's maybe the poorest 20. Thirty 30%. So yung, yung the remaining the remaining 20% of the poorest 50%, hindi pa yun nabigyan. Uh, and for that, ano ba yung susunod na nabigyan? Ang susunod na nabigyan, yung Masada, di ba? And, and there again, you have implementation questions. So, I think the point is, okay, regressive siya. There are efforts to make, to compensate for that. But in, on the implementation side, on the one hand, late siya. The implement on the other hand, fourth part of the targeted population. And then it's not clear how they will give the money to the remaining 30% or 20% of the yung kalahatin yung poorest 50% of the population. So 
so, so I think yun yung isang problema dito. Kaya, you know, yung, yung una is, there's, di ba? Nung una din yung discuss ko, masaya yung mga tao, especially those na may inka. Kasi bumaba ang taxes. But, mid-year, people started to complain, di ba? So, and I, I think yun yung, that's where the dissatisfaction is coming from. Thank you very much, and I apologize na hindi ito as organized as I would have wanted. Thank you so much for that enlightening discussion, Dr. Manasan. But before we proceed to the open forum, let us have a 10-minute break. Okay, so time check is um, 3.25, so 3.35 to 5.00. Thank you.